Hello, in this mind map, we are going to look at a very complex respiratory system. So before we start, I just want to quickly maybe divide it into large anatomical parts, the upper respiratory tract, which comprises the nose all the way down to the larynx, and the lower respiratory tract, which starts from the trachea and goes down to the lungs. So this, of course, uh, includes both the airways as well as the alveolar spaces, the interstitium, blood vessels, etc. Now, it's important for us to start with the function of the respiratory system so that you can understand clinical manifestations of disease. So the function is to absorb oxygen and to secrete carbon dioxide. So this essentially maintains the oxygenation of the blood. Now let's just very quickly uh, define respiratory failure. So when things go wrong, what happens is that there is inadequate gas exchange and this is secondary to dysfunction of the main components of the respiratory system. And clinically, this would lead to hypoxia and or, or hypercapnia. So this is uh, decreased oxygen in the blood and this is increased carbon dioxide in the blood. So we measure this using blood tests. Now, um, there's two types of respiratory failure. There is type 1, which basically uh, comprises hypoxia but without hypercapnia, and there's type 2, in which you see both hypoxia and hypercapnia. Now, let's look at what are some of the functional components that uh, are required in order for optimal absorption of oxygen and secretion of carbon dioxide. First of all, there must be ventilation, and this essentially means the movement of air and secondly, of course, gas exchange must occur. So there must be movement of gas from the alveolar spaces to the blood and from the blood to the alveolar spaces. And thirdly, the lung must be properly perfused. In other words, there must be blood flow going into the lungs. And of course, the rest of the body or the peripheries must also have circulation. So there must be peripheral perfusion as well. Now, in line with the functional components, there are, of course, the physical components, the actual organ systems or the organs or the components of the organs that we can look at, which are required for proper functioning of the respiratory system. So for ventilation, what is required is the breathing apparatus. And this includes the chest wall together with the nerves, and it also includes the central nervous system. So in other words, the respiratory center that controls our breathing in the brain. So brain conditions can also give rise to decreased breathing and respiratory failure. Uh, now, the other component that is required for ventilation is the patency of our airways. Of course, if the airways are obstructed, the air will not be able to move through them. And this can also give rise to uh, respiratory dysfunction and respiratory failure. Now, if there is disruption of the breathing, breathing apparatus, this can give rise to type 2 respiratory failure, which is both hypoxia and hypercapnia. And an example of this instance would be neuromuscular diseases. Some of the degenerative diseases actually uh, end up with a patient being unable to breathe. And therefore, there is no air movement and no ventilation. Another example would be obstruction of the airways. Again, obviously you can work out that there will be no air movement in these instances. Now, in order for proper gas exchange to occur, there must be a functional alveolar and capillary unit. So the alveolar walls must be thin, the alveoli must contain air, the blood vessel walls must be thin as well, and there must be blood flow in the capillaries. And if this is disrupted, then this can result in type 1 respiratory failure, which if you remember is hypoxia um, without hypercapnia. And a good example would be pneumonia. So this is where the alveolar spaces are actually not filled with air, but rather they are filled with inflammatory exudates of cells and uh, exudative fluid. And another good example is atelectasis. This is essentially collapse of the lung, and we'll look later at some of the conditions that can cause collapse. So the alveolar spaces are actually closed rather than open and filled with air. Now, for functional lung perfusion and peripheral circulation, what we really need and what we're talking about actually is the circulatory system, pulmonary and systemic circulation, so essentially the cardiovascular system. This must be functioning properly in order for lung perfusion and peripheral circulation to be present so that gas exchange can occur. Now, um, ventilation and perfusion must be matched so that the lung can, or the respiratory system can do its functioning of absorbing oxygen and secreting carbon dioxide. Now, when we're looking at lung diseases, it's always important to consider two 
um, main points. First of all, which component of the lung is this disease affecting? Um, and this could be, for example, the airways. So in this case, would it be the large airways or would it be the small airways? Because the clinical presentation and, of course, the diagnosis would be different. Um, would it be the alveolar spaces or perhaps even the interstitium or maybe the blood vessels? Bear in mind that these uh, components can sometimes be multiply involved in a single disease. Now, the next thing that you really want to bear in mind is the functional abnormality that is seen. Um, would this be obstructive lung disease or give rise to an obstructive pattern of abnormal lung function or restrictive? These are the two main abnormal patterns that you would see. And clinically, uh, these are mostly seen in chronic diseases. And clinically, uh, the lung function tests would be able to tell these apart. And again, it all boils down to differential diagnosis. So different conditions give rise to obstructive versus restrictive patterns. And if we know this for individual conditions, it really helps in the clinical workup of the individual patients.